Welcome, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Why Google's Cookie-less Data Policy Isn't the Only Concern in Search Marketing, presented by Athena and Search Engine Land. I'm your host, Cynthia Ramsaran. Before we begin, here are some helpful viewing tips. You can customize any of the windows for your viewing experience. And if you have any viewing issues, you can use the Q&A box at any time to communicate with us. You can also type in questions for the speaker about his presentation at any time. Without further ado, let's get to the presentation. As Vice President of Marketing, Ashley Fletcher is responsible for marketing growth at Adina. Having a long career in search and worked at Google, he's now focusing on helping brands and agencies find the transparency they need to guide their strategy. Welcome, Ashley. I'll turn things over to you. Hi, Cynthia. Thanks for the, the great intro. Great to be here. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for dialing in and, and giving up your time to uh, tune into this webinar. Uh, it's a big subject today in cookie-less um, cookie world as we know it. Um, so we'll be going, going to be talking about that uh, particular topic and um, search as a whole. So uh, I will, I'll give you a little bit of an explanation about Athena as well. Um, but we'll try and give you some uh, ideas as to, to what to do in a, a constantly changing world um, and search landscape as well with, with all of these changes coming in uh, that affect privacy. So a little bit about me, um, as, I, as Cynthia said, uh, VP of Marketing at Athena uh, with the leaders in, in search intelligence. I've been in search um, quite a long time now, so I think it's over actually 15 years. Um, so it does feel like a lifetime. Um, I spent uh, time at Google uh, on the search ads team there. Um, and short about amount of time on the Google Shopping team as well. Uh, and then um, a short stint at Critio. So I feel relatively qualified to, to be able to talk around cookie lists and tracking, um, so targeting platform there. Um, and then, as I mentioned, here at Athena now, um, going great guns and um, delivering great talks like this. So uh, great to be here. So. I just wanted to uh, reflect on or, or talk or dial into search um, before we, we kick off. And, and hopefully there's um, a fair amount of people on the call that either work at direct brands or, or working with um, agencies, whether they're um, boutique search agencies or global uh, media agencies as well. I think um, it's obviously been uh, turned upside down in a number of ways. Uh, first, thinking about the, the consumer and where they go and where they are. Um, we've all had to go um, hunting in new markets and, and trying to keep up pace with uh, where they are now and their kind of habits and, and what's happening. So we've seen this, um, our audiences now um, disperse locally, behaviors change. Um, it's taken a lot of legwork and, and brain work to try and understand um, what they're doing now. So, um, so that's the, the first piece that we're trying to um, catch up in this evolution or having to adapt to. The second one, and I love this um, example, uh, the Indiana Jones fan, but I think for those um, search marketers or any marketers um, on the call now, um, I think you can probably at one point in time feel like that character where you're having to, to balance something and very carefully reset the balance and, um, and do it successfully without the house falling around you. So whether that's moving budgets carefully, uh, moving strategy, um, team shape, size, um, you know, trying to um, accommodate working from home, all of those types of challenges is certainly um, a juggling act there. So, um, so I like that one. And then more recently, um, we're talking about a cookie-less world. We're talking about privacy front and center um, for all of the um, organizations, in particular Google, um, and that's what everyone cares about, and everyone wants to see a solution to that and a remedy to it. So it is good that they're trying to, you know, make the right steps in that direction. And the, the two-year plan to go cookieless uh, is certainly in flight at the moment, and we'll, we'll talk about flock, uh, the flock change in, in a second. And then on top of all of that, as marketers, um, your boss still says to you, right, we've still got to grow this year. We've still got to find new customers. We've still got to keep winning. So, um, so that's um, the, the main evolution. You can't lose sight of the fact that we're still in this performance mindset with digital. Um, you know, whatever we put in, we want to get out as well. So uh, that's a, a constant evolution, which I'm sure everyone can empathize with on the call. Cookie-less data is um, 
as we know, is, is a huge subject. And um, if this webinar has caught the eye of not only the search folks on search engine land, but anyone that works in brand, legal, um, any of those teams as well, it is a change that impacts a whole swathe of um, job titles. So um, it is it is something that's obviously getting a lot of uh, media coverage um, at the moment and people trying to understand it. Um, are you going to be late to the party and understanding what this means to you? Um, I think everyone's starting to get that on their radars now. So, you know, the, the main um, headline is here, obviously, Google want to kill off uh, third party uh, cookies in Chrome uh, within two years. So the cynical folks may feel like, well, we're just creating this other third party cookie data. In another way that actually they're making very big strides to, to actually adhere to what customers want now. We don't want to be monitored. We don't want a camera in our face all the time knowing every movement. So, you know, that is, um, that is a, a, a good change there on the positive side. So understanding and understanding which side of the fence you're on, get your heads around that first. Um, the next piece is obviously falling out of this is, is how they're going to market with these changes. So what the flock, um, you'll, you'll see that plastered everywhere as well. So I'm quite happy to use that in, uh, in this webinar today. But um, around cohort learning, and, and this is born of um, lots of AI models as well. So again, it's a key takeaway for you today is trying to understand what, what this means for your business, in particular in retargeting. What does it mean? To, to focus in on cohorts. So um, in my understanding and my language, it's a taxonomy for everything that applies to search. And again, um, you're targeting bigger cohorts rather than going one-on-one -on -one with personalization. So, so that's where they're pushing there. And the 73% stat that we've, uh, we've put around audience targeting is because you know, it's, it's fresh and it's new to a lot of people and people are feeling like, well, that's my go-to strategy at the moment, I must hold on to that. So it's no surprise that, um, you know, marketers feel like that's the most effective tactic, um, but they don't know how to react to that. So um, we'll include that one as well. So then focusing in on the search lens. So cookie-less data, what does that mean to search? Um, it means an awful lot because um, it doesn't, it won't change the landscape as to how you crave that transparency in your market. And that's where Athena fits as well. Um, and if you just look back, even if you go to the Google News tab, type in Google Ads, have a look at all of the recent changes, even in the last four weeks, it's actually quite overwhelming as to how much changes in our sphere and our advertising platform. And it's an awful lot to keep up to date with. So, for example, the, the more recent um, match modifying um, changes, which we have an article, we'll, we'll share the link with the audience as well. But take a look at that because, again, it's, it's more, more changes towards AI automation, but you, you are losing that transparency on what's happening in your auction. And then on the right-hand side of this slide, you've got some um, attribution updates that were rolled out um, two weeks ago on conversion tracking, zero clicks, um, there's a challenge around that and that particular piece of transparency as well that's coming through on Google Ads. And again, the sunsetting of um, target CPA, target ROAS, again, it's, it's, it's so much change going on. Just try not to get lost in all of that. And it's, it's very hard to, to keep abreast of it. So again, I mean, it doesn't mean that you'll have control of these moving forward because it's another change that you need to get across. The, the one pain point that I wanted to, to talk to you around, just briefly around pain points and Google changes as well, um, is because you know, we, we experience ourselves in brand CPCs going up. You know, we're um, competitive in the market. Uh, we've recently gone or uh, acquired organizations. So again, we're on people's radar. When that happens, you know, people are on your coattails as well. Um, but fear not, if you are seeing brand CPCs increase, and you empathize with that solution to it. And again, we've written this up, and so please take a look from the write-up from Aman here. And I've just plotted our own brand CPC is where we went through this world of pain with Google changes, uh, and we can come out the other side. So again, um, you know, stay strong with brand CPCs rising at one, one time or another. So 
in essence, really try and try and keep up with all of these Google changes, not just Cookieless World, what's happening with tracking, because it impacts your role and performance as a whole. Um, we try and keep up to date with these um, on our blog as well. So take a look at um, all of the updates that come through. But again, if you are working agency side, ensure that you have a cadence set that you are circulating this type of bite-sized news to, um, to your brands and your clients as well. Um, if you are brand side, then try and get a regular cadence in your calendar just to make sure that you do have your finger on the pulse as to what's going on in your industry and Google Ads as well. So um, just a recommendation there. So that's a bit of an intro about Cookieless and then focusing the lens on search and just a little bit of context around who Athena are if you haven't heard of us before. Uh, we really focus in on first party data, okay? And that's the, that's the real link to um, Cookieless and, and where advertisers will wanna go to guide their strategy. So for a moment, I just wanna imagine that you're in control of the world's most powerful radar um, that radar is pointed at Google search, okay? And the first piece that we'll bring back to you is that we'll inspect, okay? We'll inspect with search intelligence what is going on on the cert page. And we'll do that at an unrivaled scale. And we bring back your whole market, not just terms that you're appearing on, but the terms that you're not appearing on and are relevant to you, okay? So we bring all of that back and of course, it's refreshed um, at a very, very high daily cadence as well. Then you bring in the machine. The machine will tell you what is going on in your market and how to react. This is the key piece in um, investing in any kind of solution is where, where are the actionable insights? What do I do with this data? And this is the kind of secret source that's guiding agencies and brands to react in challenging times. When should you react a flight path for your airline when demand comes back. You need to know those signals because that's where the consumers and the market's going. So us telling you competitor A has just left, there's a gap, go and exploit it, or someone's come in, again, you need to react to it. So getting across that is really key. And then of course, once you have that position, you can protect your position. It's far easier being uh, a leader of the pack, um, protecting your brand leadership. But beyond that as well, once you set that benchmark, feed the rest of your team. This doesn't just sit in the search team, this sits with the heads of digital, the heads of brand and CMOs because it does guide business strategy. And then with all of that, you win at speed. So it's getting you to to make better decisions faster and you're relying on first party data to do that. My internet connection, just saw something buzz up there. Uh, are we all good, Cynthia, all coming through okay? Yes, you are coming yeah. through. Your audio is coming through very strong. Good, good. thank you. Uh, just checking in. Uh, so then on the right-hand side, we have the trusted brands that we work with as well. And then of course, our agency partners. So I think we're gonna go to our first poll now. So we wanted to um, just get this first poll out there. So if the audience could just take a look at this quick, quick question, I'll, I'll read through these as well, because it will really shape the conversation going forward and for Q&A as well. So which one of these are the most impacted by cookie-less data? So cookie-less data change, how does this impact you? So please pick one of these. Does it impact personalization, audience data for customer acquisition, how you go about location targeting, brand infringement, or monitoring? competition and trends. If the audience could please um, select those or one of those options, that'd be great. I'll give you a few seconds there. Okay, and let's have a look at some answers. Awesome. Okay, so that's where we're expecting it to go. I think that supports the um, the data point that we had around audience data uh, for customer acquisition in the earlier slide. If you remember the 76%, I believe it was. Um, personalization, uh, a key one as well. And certainly want to talk to that. I've got some points um, that I'd like to mention later on around the user journey as well. So we think slightly more holistically about personalization, not just in the, the ad um, area as well. Uh, location targeting, good to see that on the board as well. And then a couple of people talking about brand infringement um, and monitoring competition trends. So thank you for that. 
that's great to see the first poll. So the agenda for today, um, we've got five um, bullet points to talk through. So the, the premise here is to give the audience um, some ideas on where to go to next. This may not be the perfect fit for your vertical, but at least plant the seed in what you could do to, to react and where to go. So we use um, some of Athena's own insights in these examples. Um, again, if you have questions on those, please um, put them in the Q&A um, at the end. Um, but we really want to bring this to life with some insights for the audience to look at, OK, and some real life client examples. So, um, so hopefully we'll get the uh, ideas flowing there. So let's go one through to five. So the first one, we'll, we'll look at personalization. We'll then talk about audience data, how to react with that. Location targeting, which is obviously a very, very hot topic at the moment as well. We'll then look at brand protection, because any kind of brand marketer at the moment, um, particularly when there is so much volatility in market, should be protecting their brand from day one. And then we'll talk about monitoring competitors and trends as well. So these are all geared towards new ideas on where you can go uh, in times of change. So let's look at the first one in personalization. So it's a, a very big topic and applicable to um, the recent flock changes as well. So if you get into the, the details of what that means, it means um, single user IDs that you would typically retarget will likely not exist in the future. It means they're going to go into smaller cohorts where there will be a group of individuals. Uh, I support Liverpool, the soccer team. Uh, I am male. Um, they will be put into a cohort of individuals. Now, when we retarget to those likely in the future, it means I won't get a highly, highly personalized view to me, but I'll be matched similar to other people that behave like me. So what that means is um, we're, we're kind of um, going on a slightly broader lens on our messaging. And if you look at that or, or start to think from a personalization in the search perspective and how you approach ad copy, um, particularly through retargeting or even your generic um, customer acquisition or, or target um, CPA for new customers, then think about where the user is in their journey there. So um, it's easy actually to be very dismissive of ad copy, run the same stuff, um, don't uh, refresh that. But once you get into the data of your market, it changes an awful lot. So I would um, look at some of the examples that we've got here that leverage kind of messaging around time, location-based relevance, uh, messaging um, to, to really hone in on that relevance as well. So, And then focusing on the intent. Where are they at the moment? If you know that I'm researching for that red jersey at the moment, a journey from, in, from awareness, intent to purchase, and align your messaging, even from a search funnel, it can be incredibly powerful. So we've got some examples here on the right-hand side with our technology that's being brought back from the SERP um, because we have this first-party data. This is out in the wild um, and for us to, to collect. You can actually understand how it's trying to adapt to the user journey. It's very subtle. Um, there's lots of changes that go through the market at the moment. But if you think about the, the growth in something like curbside pickup, um, again, that's coming through very, very strong as a key message in acquiring new customers. That's something that I want that's convenient for me. So they're all areas that you should be dialing up in your messaging. So that's one area to, to think about personalization, getting out of that very hyper-focused one-on-one -on -one message to actually a cohort and a group of messaging around that target audience. The next one is actually, um, in times of change, it's often um, prompted the business to change their strategy and way of thinking. I've actually got an uh, example here, but we've got, we've got two that I can talk to. Um, so Chick-fil-A, obviously, they, um, I, I didn't know this until we started looking at the data, um, are closed on Sundays. Um, so um, they always saw a decrease in click share um, over the weekend. Now, if you are um, after you know, an aggressive customer uh, acquisition targets, you've got to get new customers in. Why would you give up that um, X amount percentage market share to your nearest competitors around that time? Um, so again, this is an insight that wouldn't just sit with the search team. You would probably send that up um, to the uh, 
you know, the, the head of brand, the head of the digital agency, or, or even the CMO at this point, um, because it's it's a fundamental change as to how the business operates. But again, things like this can can change. We have another uh, example in finance where they never had um, call centers open a weekend as well. But again, when you start addressing the available market there and you start personalizing the message at a weekend, then you start more customer acquisition. So the real takeaway here is be quite open-minded as to how you approach this and don't think that it's just a strategy that has to change in search to move forward. The next one is, is a great insight as well, coming from our partners over at Media Lab, uh, the agency that we work with and the brand um, Chipotle as well. Um, this was, they were really, uh, well, they were originally uh, very dependent on auction insights to um, focus in on who's in their market at any given time. And again, it didn't really meet up to, to standards. So um, plugging in the Athena data here, they could see this local hourly shifts. So their personalization around specific hours in the auction in um, locations like Austin, you could dial up um, the offers, you could manage partners a hell of a lot better and get really hyper-focused as to in that location, what's the personalized offers that we can really kind of dial up. So um, it also addressed more competitive behavior um, in these regions, because it's very easy to look at, let's say, a state level and assume everything is, is uh, the same and constant. It's not. Once you start to get into these um, hourly auctions and understanding here, it's very, very different. So great visual there just to really um, show um, where the activity is, how competitive, and obviously reacting to a personalized approach there. So to summarize on the personalization piece, try and take your mind set away from um, this hyper-focused um, 1v1 retargeting model and actually go for larger cohorts. So again, thinking around time, location, that applies to near me searches. What's, um, what, what does that audience want right now? Um, and then again, it, it really prompts you to, to understand if you're going hyper-targeted in search like this to adapt, um, you know, what are the best times of day? How, where does your audience um, really focus in on there? And again, getting the mindset to, to groups of uh, new customers that way. So the next one is audience data. So again, very applicable to um, cookie lists and the change on flock and um, updating remarketing lists. So we've got to um, think here around what can you use if it is going to be harder, and it's, it's likely it will be harder to target um, you know, individual users and bringing those users across from different platforms where Google's creating more of a walled garden just to, to play in their ecosystem, what can guide your strategy today that's first-party data, because obviously we want something that's um, compliant, that is observed data that's out in open source already to guide your strategy? And here at Athena, we believe there are not you know, that many options on, on the market as it stands at the moment. Um, and that's what advertisers need to really make the next step. So leveraging search intelligence, which is your key channel. I'm sure everyone um, through these times of change has had to minimize um, some display, minimize some radio, minimize um, TV. Um, so really, um, you know, search has been the one constant. And I think... If you can leverage more from that channel, then that's the one that you'll probably invest in the most in as it stands um, at the moment as well. So then expanding in oh, person, uh, personalization alternatives. And what I mean by that is what can you do on your user journey now if you do have logged in users? How much better can you make that experience on return users to search? So um, either support or returns or someone that's logged in on your platform already, how can you make that even more personalized once they're in the app or on the, the, web, uh, the website as well? So again, it's, it's really thinking about that, that final piece of the journey that you can control, which is your product, um, and really um, making that hyper-personalized as well rather than um, the first piece, which is obviously um, display. So some of the challenges here, I think we're seeing this um, 
uh, in the early data anyway in the poll is you know there's initial shock to the system there's an over reliance on audience data and to me this is my own personal opinion is um, audience data equals new customer acquisition you know if you're really focusing on growth there then change your mindset to a, a growth strategy um, and just not keep reverting to type on audience so again there's um, so much opportunity in search as it stands at the moment it doesn't have to be just with audience um, and so you really want to leverage tools that give you a different view on your market um, ones that can help you grow no one wants to grow or gain less customers we all want to grow new customers um, I think you have to be aware of compliance changes in your industry anyway I think anyone on this call should you know pass on to peers or at least um, mention to their the CFOs or compliance officers what's going on in the auction and, and in the market at the moment. It's, it's our jobs to stay abreast of that and obviously keep our customers happy as well. We don't want to risk any privacy issues there. So um, I think the key piece is here is just keeping up with that pace of change. Um, once you do that, is just understanding what you can do with your market once it's set. I think we'll we'll talk about more benchmarking techniques to copy as well. So again, the percentage of marketers who will still say you know audience is their most effective tactic um, is is just worry. I think it's just trying to understand what's out there and what we can do. Um, and again, bringing it back to targeting new customers. Um, think about your market. Where could you go to next? I think it's. It's challenging if, if budgets are being um, you know, reduced, there's, there's less wiggle room in there, but trying to find new opportunities is really the, the way to look forward at this. And I think you can do that with new visualizations that go into your stakeholders. So say, yes, there's been an over-reliance on audience, but you know what? I've mapped out this market here. I've taken on this third party, sorry, first party data, um, and I can see there's opportunity here. And, and this is where we're helping teams overcome that shock to the system at the moment. This may be um, agency members who are trying to grow their accounts. Um, it might be brands who are looking to expand because their market has completely disappeared in one sh way, shape, or form. Um, so the example that you're looking at here is um, a state-based um, view, click share, and understanding competition, where that is. So again, um, we can identify that there's strong challenges to click share, potential acquiring new customers here with our audience data um, in this region. Uh, whereas in this region, we have a strong share of clicks. We're, we're winning. We've got a leaderboard here. The company is very happy with that. Um, and where do we go next? So it's about um, you know getting to grips with the fact that yes, you over reliance on audience data but changing the mindset to say, where, where, where do we go to next? What is the next solution? And evolve that way. So really bring the focus in on um, first party data, um, leverage search intelligence, understand what you have in your own wheelhouse that can really get you out of this kind of sticky situation with audience targeting. Um, and then think about product. How can that, evolving that, and the personalization around that really move you on to the next level? So that concludes that um, question, uh, section, sorry. Moving on to sections three. So this is location targeting. So again, we want to look at opportunities here. Where, where do we go to next when there's a big change that impacts um, our market? Um, I think everyone understands that we're all in different um, regions and, and coming out of lockdowns and understanding that. But it used to be very simple. Everyone was at one phase. Uh, and one step. Now we're at all different sequences. We're all changing behaviors. We're all doing different things at different times. Um, some regions uh, are more behind than others, but generally we're, we're moving forward. So I think understanding really what's happening in your own state or region is, is kind of critical here, because again, it can be really easy to get lost in all the noise that's in press at the moment and understand, you know, what are your state-based regulations um, around um, what's going on with the pandemic. Understanding locally what's open and what's not is going to help move your, uh, help decide your next move. So where to go to next. Um, 
without doubt, you know, consumer behavior has changed. Um, I myself shop far more locally. Hi, Ashley. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but your yeah. audio seems to be Scripted cutting in and out. The local businesses um, really come to the, the fore on this. And you're perhaps signing is that thing. I mute. Two seconds. Okay. Um, are you going to refresh? And then I will just remind the audience now, if you have a question, um, go ahead and type it in the Q&A box while we refresh our browser and have Ashley come back and join us. Um, while he does that, I will just quickly go over the agenda um, to let you know what's coming up next. Um, he went over personalization, audience data, and we are going through location targeting. Um, next is brand protection and then monitoring your competitors and trends. So stick around while we wait for Ashley to join Hi us there. and type your questions in. Hi, Ashley. Welcome Hi back. There. Video Apologies. and audio is strong. No worries. Um, I was you. just going quickly over the agenda. So if you want to push uh, to the slide that you were at last and I will mute. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that audience. Um, we were going strong there and thanks for the, uh, the shout out, Cynthia. Let's go through these. We're nearly there. So I was on uh, local targeting. Um, I think we all know how big this is. I just want to make sure the audience is aware of um, the size of opportunity um, that's out there for advertisers. And it's easy, again, to be dismissive that local doesn't apply to me. And I think it's actually worth the time researching and understanding uh, what your audience is doing, what their new behaviors are, um, if that user journey has behaved, so, uh, is, has changed as well. So I don't think there's anything um, radical in, in the data here, but we know that the mobile is just going to play a huge part. And we've got some data that, that suggests that it's still dismissed by some brands and some brands have certainly have a desktop strategy and a, a mobile strategy as well. But in times of change and when you're trying to hunt down new users um, in this cookie-less world, it's, um, it's really key to understand the, the user journey, and that is all local at the moment. So huge amounts of opportunity out there. Again, that's a huge number on your screens that you can see at the moment. So we're predicting by the end of this year, 1.4 trillion um, to come through local businesses. And I'm sure you've all experienced at the moment your Google reps reaching out to you as to how you can adapt that strategy as well. I, I mentioned um, Google My Business earlier. Again, that's a, a real big pivot um, in that direction there as well. So again, slight change in mindset, but um, it's getting, getting ready for change. So what we see when it comes to targeting new users uh, is understanding you know, what's going on in your ecosystem. So We've got an example here that's um, originally started at a, a national view, and then we have um, zoom in um, at a state-based view. And here we're looking at uh, infringements by desktop. And basically, this advertiser uh, was very dismissive of each state's comparison in this and understanding that local markets are actually all a bit the same, but they're not. Um, and what's, what was happening here is they're having a heavy influence on their, their brand infringements and actually people using their brand term in states they wouldn't, were not originally looking at. So again, Auction Insights wouldn't tell you this because they weren't appearing on these terms at the time. But um, here we have the proof coming through. And again, the, the pain point of this, of not understanding the local opportunity, is they're starting to see PCs go up, their keywords are uh, starting to get a very crowded place. And, uh, a leaky bucket here on, on clicks as well. And here we tend to use um, bespoke dashboards um, via our solution services with um, Tableau um, to really bring that to life. And, and every advertiser has a, a different use case and a need. So again, the example that we've got here 
um, is bespoke to this uh, particular advertiser. Again, it's, it's worth noting how to be cautious on ad, uh, ad copy when you go down to a local level. So again, you can be quite dismissive that you take your um, state-based or national level messaging and just assume that that applies to a local level. And you'll be surprised the amount of times that it does not. So again, um, Southwest here that we pulled out of the, the system, again, we looked at a local level. And I, actually, we could see some nuances on where ad copy is changing quite well. But for example, if you're on this call at the moment and you're over-reliant on dynamic search ads to really drive your ad copy and engagement, um, that could be quite a risk here. Because if you think about what the consumer wants at a local level, it's very, very different. So just um, you know, take that. It's, it's great to go automated and, and manage this at scale. Um, but try and um, utilize you know, the handcrafted stuff where possible, um, because this is really what the, uh, the users want and engage with as well. So focus on um, the in-between states and, and don't be dismissive at a macro level. I think ad copy again, really focusing on that by location. Don't be over-reliant on things like um, dynamic search ads or um, heavy automation on your ad copy creation, because your competition will outperform you there as well. I just wanted to um, quickly touch on um, brands protection as well, because in times of change um, with cookie-less and tracking changes, Google Ads changes, it's, it's very easy to take your eye off the ball when it comes to brand. Um, and those on the call now should really protect your brand. Um, users who are coming in on brand, typically the best, you know, they have empathy, they have some sort of awareness, but there's most definitely intent there. So. Again, this is relevant to all of the change that's going on in the market. And I just wanted to dial up a couple of examples here. So uh, with Burberry, uh, the brand and our agency partners, Merkel, um, we've got examples here where it's actually very tricky to manage um, the search ecosystem when you have lots of um, resellers and partners eating into your click share as well. Um, the pain point here is um, your CPCs go up. You don't want that if you're all trying to acquire all of those customers there. Um, and again, you know, top ad is quite hard to get to at the moment. There's no transparency on position, which again is something that um, Athena will, will dial up here for you um, as we bring through this search intelligence. But again, it's just being on the ball as to what a heavy competitor like Farfetch would do running better offers here as well. They can de disrupt this whole market. Um, and offers play a really key part in protecting your brand because that turns a lot of heads. It drives a lot of engagement. So just be aware of how they're doing it. And again, something very opaque and, um, and vague like Auction Insights really wouldn't give you this, uh, this level of transparency that you need. Again, the, the good piece on um, brand infringements, once you do get on top of the data here and understand what's going on in your market, you have proof. Once you have the proof, you can send it to your Google Ads rep. Um, they can help take, take that down. You can give it to your legal teams. They can take legal action, threaten legal action against your, um, your competitors that are using your brand in the wrong way. You need to understand what damage they're doing and that you can repair. Again, talking to the benchmark capabilities earlier in my um, call, it's, it's really key to understand how you are in your level playing field at the moment. If you don't create that view, it makes it very, very hard to, to try and remedy it. So really on um, brand terms, you need to monitor that. You need to understand your competitors as well and your partners. Um, examples that we saw earlier in the talk as well about the Chipotle, um, you know, they have lots of resellers there as well. Um, understanding market trends, so the, the top ads that you saw with Burberry uh, and Merkel as well, you know, what's happening, who's gaining which spot, um, and is that inflating the, the costs of your market? And again, um, infringements is great. You've got to get that, that proof to really make uh, change happen. So monitoring competition in trends, this is the, the final piece that I'll, I'll just quickly um, touch on as well on this talk, and then we can go to, to Q&A. Um, loan ranges, uh, great feature that we love here at Athena. Uh, you're all probably asking, what is a loan ranger? 
no it's not a not a cowboy um but it's kind of like a cowboy um so it's where you appear top four organic and paid but you have no competition around you um, and you can see the examples that we've got on the right hand side here um, search managers love this in times of change because you can adapt quickly to your market you can um, pull back on those paid ads um, and let organic pick up that um, that visit there. You can bring organic through all the new content that you've produced there to, to create a really rich um, user journey. So again, Lone Rangers, really actionable, huge, huge savings to be made there um, on your campaigns as well. When you utilize first party data like this. Again, um, quickly on mobile versus desktop. So. Again, this is not being dismissive to the user journey um, being the same on both devices. We've got uh, Grubhub here who are actually you know, really pushing hard on gaining market share in mobile over these month on month periods. So you know, it's, it's a key device for them. There's obviously activity happening there. It's key to their business strategy. But you can see again from the two, um, the two charts, um, top and bottom, where these are growing, where these are shrinking as well. But, but getting an understanding of that really guides you to a growth strategy when you need to um, really double down on customer acquisition. So really on that, you know, focus on your, your competitors, understanding the, the messaging, share of clicks, um, you know, understanding what's happening by devices is, is really, really key. And it starts um, shifting your focus with the product team on a really, really good product uh, user journey as well. We don't want to think about just clicking on an ad. What is their experience beyond the ad and on the product as well, and on the website or app? So one final poll for the audience. Um, there's a lot of insights I've, I've covered there, but I just wanted to ask you, um, how are you feeling about dealing with cookie-less um, you know, versus when this webinar started? Um, I'm hoping there are some ideas and there's a glimmer of hope and light for you there. But please be honest and, and fill out um, this quick survey for me, if that's OK. Hey, Ashley, I am going to let you know that your yep. video is frozen. And now is a great time while the audience is answering this question. If you'd like to hit that icon in the uh, control panel with the camera, you can disable your camera because your audio is strong. Um, and then we can continue the webinar that way. Okay. Um, so I'll ask the poll question. I think Ashley has dropped off and is refreshing. Uh, so how are you feeling about dealing with cookie lists versus when the webinar started? All right. Um, I think the audience is ready to see the results, Ashley. Cool. Let's have a look. Good. I'm happy with that. Yeah, better. Um, yeah, thank you for being so honest, everyone. Hopefully, um, for those that are in the same camp, you can um, fire over some uh, Q&A now and we can get some questions answered for you. We'd like to work up the much better, but um, it is a very, very big um, subject in, in Cookie as well. So let's um, just quickly skip through the, the five takeaways um, here. Um, so again, familiarize how this um, strategy impacts you. Location is big. Everyone should get across that. Um, search intelligence there on, on the right block on your screen. Again, think about how your CMO would use that data. How, how would you leverage that? Um, audience data is a big concern. You know, how are you going to leverage that moving forward? My recommendation is, is switching the, the mindset to a growth strategy and thinking about the user journey. Um, and then again, just being aware of brand. If you give your competitors an inch, they'll, they'll take a mile for sure. And then again, if I've confused you at all today, um, we're going to follow up with uh, a guide to paid search uh, in a post cookie list world as well. Um, so find that in your inboxes um, shortly after this session. But with that, I would love to go to Q&A. Sure, and we've got quite a number of questions, so I'm going to dive right in. Um, the first one is from Gil, and Gil asks, how does going cookie-less affect mobile? How is it different, if at all? Yeah, good question. So I think coming back to my original ask, um, question on mobile is um, 
if you understand your market share and, and where you are by device, I think that will give you the, the initial insight to make that next step. If you know that you are only, say, 15% market share on your available queries or relevant queries, then at least you've got a, a platform to then build and acquire that. Um, you can then look at um, new markets or search term groups. So I think I, I initially just bring it back to the search realm. Um, mobile is going to be very different because obviously the, the app experience will be far, far heavier than a desktop experience. But at the moment, um, and what I mean by that is users will interact with more apps. But um, desktop is still so prominent at the moment because so many users are still at home um, and obviously the split is, is much heavier there as well. So yes, yeah, so that, that would be my recommendation. Start with your market share on mobile, understand the behaviors, um, but be obviously wary of, of how the apps and that user journey interacts there as well. Okay, our next question is from Andrew. And Andrew asks, how do you think this move away from third-party cookies impacts advertisers' ability to run successful website remarketing campaigns as well as dynamic remarketing? Yeah, so I think um, it'll be a shock initially to the, the product teams who need to really invest in the logged-in user experience. If you, if you imagine um, the absolute best experience that you can have going to your brands and how you interact um, I think it's about being super transparent if you know if they want to opt in they will you need to make that super clear to them um, so I, I think there's a, an issue here for the the product teams and the user journey we're not just talking digital advertisers here um, and then on the other piece, I think um, you're working with a Google, a walled garden here on Instagram, and I don't feel like um, these bridges will connect anytime soon. You're going to have to get comfortable working in silos. And, and what is that bridge in between? What you know? How do you create that view? I think that's all all a bit vague at the moment. Um, and our recommendation, obviously, um, as you saw with saw with the insights, is is to double down on on the search activity here. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Nina wants to know, well, she's asking, can you go over more specifically what audiences we'll lose uh, in market affinity, for example? Yeah, so uh, as I understand it, the most recent changes um, have applied to conversion tracking and attribution models. So I think the if you have a read up on the flock models that are coming out from Google, it's yet to be rolled out, but that's the, um, the framework in which um, everyone's going to try and adhere to. That's, that's the cohort analysis that they're talking about. So to, to be clear, if you log into Google Ads now, it's still as it was, but there's a migration, as they said, in, um, by the end of, I think it's uh, this year, um, is to move across to, to Flock um, generally. Um, I think it's, it's gen a natural progression of AI modeling as well. Um, where you're understanding what cohorts do, what groups of people do, rather than singular um, IDs. So, um, so yeah, there's lots of reading out there on Google, but you know we haven't fully transitioned to Flock yet. But that's um, that's where they're heading. Okay, thanks. Um, Jackie is asking: Will the third-party cookie requirement impact the effectiveness of specific keyword searches? She says, "I understand the disruption to audiences, but not clear on keyword queries." And she says, "Paid specifically." Cool. Um, so, you know, we, we've had Athena you know, bringing back the observed data that we have. We, we work at a search term level. Um, so we don't utilize keyword matching. We bring back exactly what the, the user has queried into Google. So our view is crystal clear. Um, and that's what we base all of our decisions on and modeling as well. Whereas, um, again, with retargeting on um, a match type, there's um, a lot of ambiguity as to what it is that, that pushed them over, um, the conversion path. I'm, I'm pretty adamant that we'll probably see um, keyword match types disappear in the future. Um, and I think you just plug it into the machine and go. But that's, again, just my my view. So I think um, 
yeah, there's there's a lot to still understand on user behavior on the exact queries. And it feels like we're actually um, mm -hmm. regressing in the search world on where we want to go. You know, 15 years ago, it was also very, very transparent, but probably not scalable. But now we're craving going back there just to see what's actually happening um, at a search term level. Um, so that, that's what we're understanding from our advertisers and brands all over the globe as well, um, because that's the data that's obviously making the, the decisions for them. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Our next question is, do you have any recommendations on how to gather more first party data? And can you speak to the limitations of location and GOIP data? Yeah, so, so um, first party I think our I mean, audio, um, um, Ashley, are you there? There's some um, um, Google Ads script there that you could start monitoring the SERP far closer as well. I hear you now. Hi there. Are you there? Okay. We hear you now. Yep. You're back. Yeah, good stuff. Um, so my recommendation, sorry about that, um, would be um, if you're working with media agencies, ask for their solutions on first party. It's, it's a relatively new concept um, and getting ahead of the curve there. Um, you know, solutions like ourselves, um, there's you know other solutions in the market as well. But um, I, I don't believe there's a vast amount really that, that focus on, on purely first data, first party data. Okay, and our next question is from Stacy, and she's asking, are we targeting ads for specific products going away? And she says, you know, those ads where you had something in your shopping cart and it's now following you? Yeah, it's gonna make it harder for those, um, those particular vendors, um, I believe. Again, with um, the Flock rollout and um, Google's approach to this, I don't think it's gonna be as aggressive as that. Um, but I think it will push more strategy around um, brands and opting into that user experience um, in other places. So perhaps content strategy will be far bigger now. Um, and obviously experience on apps and notifications that way. But again, it's all with consent. So I, personally, I, I don't feel we'll live in a world where it's as aggressive as that have been in the past and, and ads following you around. Okay, great. I have a question from Devin, and he says, I love the idea of what Athena does, particularly with the latest location reports, but my question is, what can we actually do with the data when our campaigns are on target CPA? Smart bidding doesn't allow us to do any bid adjustments on the location level, and it also ignores my hourly bid adjustments. Okay, good question. Um, we'd love to follow up on that one, if that's okay. That's very um, complex for a quick answer here. I think what we've seen is um, advertisers particularly go hands-on with some groups, whether they can revert some changes and, and bring back more control there. Um, what, where, I'm trying to think of the best example where we've seen this. I think it could be overinflated by a number of um, different reasons. And I think opening up the market and understanding who and how that's um, you know, being impacted is really key. Uh, my mind goes to kind of ad creative and, you know, um, how engaging is it? Are you paying too much for, for that? Um, so, yeah, they would have to understand your market really or that market segment first to really understand what's, what's driving that up to bring down those costs. Yeah, good question. Thanks, Ashley. We have time, I think, for one more question. Um, Constantinos wants to know, what's the difference based on your experience, if you have, between the US and Europe and other markets, if you have experience with those two? Yes. Um, Europe, um, I would say some regions there, um, you, you certainly wouldn't, you know, in, in the past, retarget as aggressively as you would 
in some countries like the UK or the US. So there's certain nuances there as to, to how you, you go about acquiring those customers. Um, a lot of it, and I see it dismissed quite a lot, is just the, the messaging framework. So my background is in product marketing and understanding um, you know, as well what, what customers want and what the pain points are. That's also dismissed and is, is very promotional. There's no empathy there. Um, you know, running campaigns that are tuned into to what they want now is is really key. And I think understanding that by region is is far more powerful rather than just cranking some very, very aggressive bids um, that go out into market. So we have a similar outbound strategy here at Athena where we are actually um, approaching prospects with um, insights that are relevant to their market right now. So again, we're, we're sensitive to the, the market they work in um, they don't probably want to know about um, insights that aren't applicable to them. So it's, it's just care and attention by region really is, is really what it's about. I'm going to throw in one more question, and I think it's a yes or no question, so we might have time for that. Um, does it make sense to stop retargeting now and put more money into SEM? Uh, not at the moment. The, the change hasn't came, come in, but we hope that this is – Spurned your, your, spurred your thinking as to, to where you may go. Um, I feel, feel like you should be building your growth strategy for when this does kick in. This is where you go to next. You don't want to be late to the party here and then right now we've got to adapt. It's, it's all about getting ahead of the curve here. Um, and there are solutions, you know, like Athena in the market, to understand what you can do and, and where to go here. And yeah, first party data is the key. Um, and not being late to the change here is, is the other one as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ashley. That is all the time that we have today. Thank you again, Ashley, for this engaging presentation. If we didn't get to your question, we will be sure to pass it along to Athena. On behalf of Search Engine Land, I want to thank everyone in our audience for attending this webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day.